Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to thank Keith for having me here again. And uh, I also see a few friends that I saw in Berlin. So it's uh, great to be back. Um, uh, hope you, everybody enjoyed that first presentation. Um, Chuck, always, your presentations are always fantastic. So thank you for that. And 802.11b was so much simpler. Um, <laughs> It just gets harder every year. Um, so the topic that I, I'm here to talk about is wireless LAN troubleshooting. And um, it, it's not rocket science. And I'm not, it's going to be a very technical presentation. Uh, most of this presentation is going to be about common sense. Because for whatever reason, it seems a lot of times when people start troubleshooting wireless LANs, Common sense seems to go out the window. So my goal here today is um, to just kind of remind people about the things that you need to think about and that you should be doing when you're troubleshooting problems with a wireless LAN. Uh, we have people here with some outstanding wireless LAN skill sets and troubleshooting skill sets, so a lot of this will be old hat to you. But there's also a lot of new people here, and um, this is also being videotaped. So I'm hoping that a lot of people that are new to WLAN troubleshooting will watch this and just kind of think about this from a common sense perspective. So uh, quickly, I'm going to do a quick introduction of who I am, and then we'll get into the, what I call the five tenets of wireless LAN troubleshooting. And then we'll look at it at, from different perspectives, uh, going up the OSI model. So uh, if you don't know me, very quickly, I'm David Coleman, the Senior Mobility Leader for Aerohive Networks. That's just a, a goofy title my boss and I came up with. Um, I work with the Knowledge Services Department at Aerohive and uh, trying to figure out how Wi-Fi works, trying to figure out how uh, uh, our solution at Aerohive works, and then try to share that knowledge with our customers, partners, and internally. Uh, I am CWNE number four, and there's my Twitter address, and uh, I hope uh, I need more followers. One day I'll have as many as Keith. Um, we'll see. So um, uh, if you would follow me, I'd, I'd love that. Um, a lot of you know, uh, uh, have known me for a while, and there's my passport. And you know that when I travel, um, I usually get hassled because of this guy right here. Um, that is not me. He's a convicted terrorist. <laughs> but I do get mistaken for him quite a bit, uh, especially when I come back into the United States. So Homeland Security and I have a very intimate relationship. Um, I, I am the co-author of the CWNA study guide. Unfortunately, my co-author Dave Westcott is not here. So once again, there's a hashtag, where is Westcott? Maybe one of these days we'll get him to one of these conventions. Um, and we also have a, a CWSP study guide coming out. Uh, as well. So enough of the shameless plugs. Um, let's get into the troubleshooting. So uh, I like to call this the five tenets of wireless LAN troubleshooting and just five things that we're going to go over and what you need to think about. Number one is follow simple troubleshooting best practices. And I'll have some slides on this, but once again, it's just common sense. And it's mainly about asking the proper questions. Uh, if you don't ask the proper questions, you're not going to be able to, to come up with proper troubleshooting procedures. And then this, I've been saying for years, troubleshoot a wireless LAN just like you troubleshoot a wired LAN. Move up the OSI model. Start at layer one and move up. And we'll hit that again in a few slides. I'm um, going to have a lot of slides on this and a lot of discussion on this. Most Wi-Fi problems, if it indeed is a Wi-Fi problem, is they're usually client-related. Um, and there's a, a whole host of problems that can be caused by clients, and we'll get into that. And then, um, Keith will like this, Wi-Fi performance problems can usually be avoided with proper wireless LAN design. Okay, so uh, I don't have a lot of slides on this because wireless LAN design gets covered inside and out at these conferences, but um, uh, it's a huge problem in this industry, and for whatever reason, it seems to be getting worse. People just don't design wireless LANs properly, and then they wonder why the Wi-Fi doesn't work. So we'll come back to that. And then finally, wireless LANs, Wi-Fi always gets the blame. And it's many times, it's not the wireless LAN's fault. It's usually something up higher on the OSI stack. Um, but 
Uh, your end users don't know that. From the end user perspective, all they know is they can't uh, get on the internet over the wireless network. So of course, the finger pointing begins. So let's talk about quickly the first tenant, and that would be um, troubleshooting best practices. And with troubleshooting best practices, um, it's a, simply asking a lot of questions. So you're going to identify the issue by asking questions. And, uh, and these are just common sense, uh, ladies and gentlemen. When is the, the problem happening? So is there a problem with the, your wireless c connectivity uh, at all day long? Or is it at, at certain times of the day? If it's just happening at certain times of the day, say at lunchtime, near the break room, it might be a microwave oven. Uh, once again, where's the problem happening? Is it happening throughout your entire facility or is it happening in one location? Uh, like I just said, is it just happening in the break room or is it happening uh, throughout your building? Does the, and here's a, a really good one, and I can't believe people don't think of this uh, as much as they should. Is the problem affecting all your clients or is it just the CEO's laptop that's having the problem? Okay, so, um, and, and if that's the case, if it's just one device that's having a problem, then once again, you can usually look back to that in particular client and not necessarily the wireless LAN infrastructure. Of course, does the problem reoccur or did it just happen once? Uh, this can be very difficult, is how do you replicate the problem? A lot of, um, this, I'm also really big on, one of my big pet peeves is people don't have their NTP settings correct or their clock settings correct on their access points because you're trying to troubleshoot a problem and then the log files are showing 1970. Uh, okay, so um, uh, if you don't have accurate time settings uh, on your clocks, on your access points and your controllers or whatever wireless LAN solution you're using, um, it's just common sense. And so once again, this is a question you can ask, is this problem happening at a certain time of the day or is it recur recurring or did it just happen one single time? And here's the best one of all, did you make any changes recently? And you know what the answer is going to be. Almost always they're going to say, no, of course not. Um, and usually you find out that they did. Okay. so. Um, if you ask these questions, then you can start uh, um, mapping out a plan on how to fix it. So number one, identify the issue. What exactly is the problem? Once again, you're going to get there by asking the proper questions that we just went over in the last slide. Um, can you recreate the problem? Once again, this kind of goes back to one of the earlier questions. Is it occurring once or is it happening uh, multiple um, times? Uh, this is uh, tough on vendors, too. A lot of times we get phone calls uh, from customers, and they report the problem, but we can't replicate it um, back at uh, headquarters. So um, uh, if you, a lot of times it's working with the customer to try to replicate the problem, or if, uh, if they can once again point to when and where and, uh, the problem is actually happening. And, and that goes back to uh, isolating, try to uh, locate and isolating the actual cause of the problem. And once you do that, that'll give you a starting point on how you can move up the OSI model um, when you're doing your actual troubleshooting. Um, once you, um, uh, you've located and isolated the problem, then let's formulate a plan to solving the problem, implement the plan, and then hopefully you eventually fix the problem. Um, now, testing is very important. so. You know, the worst, the, I don't know about you guys, but the worst feeling in the world is when you fix something and you don't know how you fixed it, <laughs> you know? And so you fixed it, but you don't know how. So the bottom line is test to make sure you actually did fix it and then go back to, um, and to document how you fix it. And documentation is very important. And so, um, like I said, I'm old and I forget. I, I forget how I fix things sometimes, but if I document it, and it goes back to Keith talking about the blog, sometimes you look it up and go, if you have proper documentation on how you fix something, you can refer back to that. Plus, you leave breadcrumbs for other employees and other people, and you can also make that information public on your company website as well, uh, if you're a vendor, for example, so other people can just find the problems on their own. So docu documenting the problem after you've tested it and proved that you've actually resolved it is very important. Of course, uh, providing feedback to the customer once the problem's solved 
is just as important. And, you know, and they're going to appreciate it if you call them up, say, we got the problem um, resolved, and, and encourage them to um, call them in uh, if they have other problems. Now, um, so the second tenet is moving up the OSI stack. And to me, for some reason, people just don't do this with wireless. Um, you should troubleshoot a wireless LAN just like you troubleshoot a wired network. Okay, so most problems happen at the physical layer. Um, in an Ethernet network, if the Ethernet uh, cord isn't plugged into the desktop, it's not going to work. Okay, well, um, and you should start there. Um, and it's the same thing with wireless. You should start and move up the OSI model. And to do so, remember that 802.11 technology operates at layer one and layer two. Yes, sir. Well, that, that's true. I mean, and once again, um, once again, does your CEO really know what an, an IP, uh, IP address is, though? In most cases, is your CEO really going to call you up in most no, cases and say? Okay. So, I mean, obviously, then you're kind of already pointing a little higher up the OSI stack. So, I mean, there's always exceptions to every rule. I just know that I have been burned personally many times where I started doing, looking at a higher layer when I should have just looked at layer one and it's like, oh, the AP's not plugged in. And, um, and so, I mean, and, and a lot of times if you just look at layer, you don't necessarily have to get a spectrum a uh, analyzer out, but just doing quick looks at some of the lower layers um, before you m m move up, even though you see that duplicate IP address, sometimes, you know, that analysis of those lower layers only takes a couple of minutes. It's just been my experience with best practice, whether it's wired or wireless, is to start at the bottom. And remember, everybody most, I'm sure everybody in this room knows that the 802.11 standard and technology only operates at layer one and layer two. And guess what? If you can, and this actually goes back to the uh, question we just had too, if you can prove it's not a layer one and layer two problem, it's not a Wi-Fi problem, okay? And then the wireless LAN doesn't get blamed anymore, okay? So, um, once again, layer one and layer two problems, Wi-Fi problems specifically, layer one, you're going to have your RF problems, can be configuration issues, uh, wireless LAN security sessions. We're going to hit all these in the next uh, coming uh, few minutes. Uh, drivers, I'll talk a little bit about that. Drivers are one of the biggest problems we have in this industry. And then as you start moving up to layer two, you might be uh, association and authentication problems and VLANs. As you move up into the higher layers and you're outside of Wi-Fi problems, uh, you're talking about IP addresses, routing ports and firewalls at layer four, and then you start moving up towards the application layer. Okay? Now, the client is usually the culprit. Uh-oh. Uh, I got a call here. Hello, this is uh, David's uh, Wi-Fi support. Can I help you? Uh, hi, David. This is Andrew. I'm staying at the Doubletree Tempe, and uh, the Wi-Fi is not working for me because your Wi-Fi sucks. Um, well, okay, so there's no need to insult the Wi-Fi. Uh, if you're nice to the Wi-Fi, it usually modulates a little better. Um, but um, l let's see if we can uh, take a look at your problem. Do you, I'm assuming uh, you're using a laptop? Yep, I'm on my laptop right now. Okay, and you're just not getting connected to the Wi-Fi, is that correct? Right, the icon shows uh, uh, it's disconnected. Okay, so what I want you to do, sir, is to look over on the side of your laptop, and there's a little button, and it'll be like a little radio icon. Can you I, turn? I don't see it. Is it on the left or the right? It's um, look in front of yourself, sir. <laughs> oh, okay, I found it. Can you turn that on? Uh, okay, I just moved it to the other, the other position. Okay, and give it a second and see if you get connected. Searching and it just connected to Conference Center Network. Okay, well, thank you for calling Wi Fi support. Okay, so <laughs> everybody's laughing, but do you know one of the biggest support calls um, a lot of vendors get and a lot of MSPs uh, get is that? Um, it's layer one. You know, the client's the culprit. Um, they, it, it, it's the same thing as you're not plugging in the wire 
If they don't have the radio on, they're not going to connect. Now, I know this sounds simple, but I mean, uh, you know, that's why you start at layer one. This is another 101. You know, I always do this no matter what. I always disable and re-enable the client, NIC, uh, whatever the operating system is, if I have that ability, uh, just to get the drivers talking to the OS again, because they get discombobulated. And it'll just, it's amazing how that'll just solve problems sometimes. Now, um, the client is definitely, is usually the culprit. And this is a big problem right here, and that is bad drivers, okay? Um, <laughs> The, um, there's no real standard for drivers, and one of the things that I've learned from guys like Matthew Gass and Chuck and really smart people that are a lot smarter than me is that we're kind of at the mercy of the chipset vendors. And um, so they, uh, and sometimes, especially on the client side, their first generation drivers aren't so good and you might start running into connectivity and compatibility issues. And a lot of that times, um, those are very hard to solve sometimes. And sometimes that involves getting a lot of packet captures and uh, forwarding those to our engineering department and see if we, we can work things out. But uh, very often, uh, you'll just find that with one particular device or, um, or a new uh, type of devices that they've deployed um, when they've upgraded. Um, there's no real standard for drivers, unfortunately. Um, of course, you can also have um, improperly configured uh, supplicants. We are going to spend a lot of time on that towards the end of the presentation. And here's something that really makes the salespeople at my company very upset when I say this. If you can, upgrade your clients first, okay? Um, yeah, uh, my company and, and our competitors, we love to sell APs, but if you can upgrade the clients first um, with newer technologies, if it does, in fact, in, exist at the client level, you're usually uh, going to be happier. Now, I know that's not always easy to do. We do live in a, kind of a BYOD world where everybody brings in their own devices as well, and you can't always control the client population. But if you, as an administrator, have any kind of control over the client population, upgrade the clients first. And this thing, this is what, I, I never understand this, and I've had this discussion with lots of people like Devin and other people, it's like your customers will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars, upgrading their infrastructure, but then when it comes to upgrading um, some of the laptops, they, they still stay with a laptop running 802.11b. Um, but they don't, they don't want to spend the money on that, and then that just drags everybody down, okay? So, Upgrading the clients um, uh, newer, with the newer technology before the infrastructure, if you can do it, it's always a good strategy. Um, of course, everything's backward compatible, right? Okay, well, legacy client devices, when you introduce new technology, they can't uh, necessarily, they don't always uh, can connect. So maybe you upgrade your AP uh, with uh, new technology, and all of a sudden your legacy clients cannot connect. And a lot of that has to do uh, with client drivers not knowing how to handle the new information elements that are in the beacon frames and the probe response frames. So uh, a very common one that we see all the time is 802.11r and fast BSS transition or voice enterprise, whatever you want to call it, um, where it puts a new information element into the beacon frames. And a lot of times legacy clients um, just don't know how to deal with it, and they crap out. Um, so that's why sometimes when you implement a voice enterprise on your APs, uh, if you, um, you might have to have a separate SSID if you still want to support those legacy clients. So understand that if you introduce new technologies, there might be um, problems sometimes if you don't upgrade your clients. Now, there's always been a problem. I've always said, I get asked the question all the time, well, is there a list somewhere, a big list where you can go and it has all the capabilities of all the clients and what they can do? Well, um, Mike has a pretty good one. Um, and we, I don't know if he's here or not, but Mike, if you are, oh, there you are, sir, right in front of me. Thank you uh, for this. Um, it's, it's, uh, and I encourage everybody to help Mike out with this too because this is very, very useful, okay? Obviously, there's tens of thousands of other clients, but he's hit a lot of the key ones, okay? So, Mike, thanks again, sir. Um, so, 
upgrade your clients first. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the next couple of slides. I think you guys uh, were pounded with this in the last session. Clients aren't very happy on 2.4 gigahertz. It's a disaster zone. There's only three uh, usable channels. Um, it's impossible to prevent uh, co-channel interference. It's, it's impossible. Um, there's high SNR, uh, oversaturation of 802.11 uh, devices, and lots of non-802.11 interference. Did you say 2.4 is dead? Um, <laughs> no, I would say it's on life support. Um, it, but no, it's, you know, it's not completely dead, but it might as well be. Um, I think uh, we had, uh, it's, oh, and uh, there was another presentation of, a few months back where, uh, from that, uh, it's, it's a zombies. You know, everybody in 2.4 gigahertz are zombies. So it's a living dead. And so, so there you go. And once again, five gigahertz is the answer. There's a lot more frequency space. And as Chuck was showing you, in the next two years, we got more coming, okay? And we're going to need it. Uh, and we are going to need it. And you know, hopefully a lot of the IoT devices are going to be going to lower frequencies as well. So I actually stole this from Keith. Um, yeah, I saw him at a presentation where he makes his customers do this pledge. Um, so I created a hashtag for it. And the pledge is, is don't deploy 2.4 gigahertz clients radios when you buy new ones. And uh, so uh, Keith actually makes his customers do this. If you can, try to get them to make sure that they can deploy uh, radios that, also, that uh, support gigahertz. If they do support 2.4, not exclusively, OK? And ensure that they support the DFS channels and the latest and greatest technology. Now, another shout out to Keith here very quickly. This will prevent a lot of your troubleshooting calls. Proper design r reduces the support calls. So once again, I'm not going to spend a whole session here on design, but um, it, we design differently now. Okay, it's not like the 802.11b days where we used to design for coverage. Now it's all about designing for airtime consumption. And uh, you just heard Chuck even talk about it. You know, that's kind of the whole point of multi-user MIMO is to cut down on the airtime consumption. Of course, there's other known ways that you can do on that, uh, do that, including reducing your data rates. The whole uh, proper design, you're trying to cut down on CCI, to cut down on the airtime consumption, reduce overhead. Um, this is my new catchphrase. I heard somebody at Aerohive use this term the other day, uh, data rate pruning, um, so, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, disable the data rates. Um, disable the lower data rates, okay? Um, if you can turn off all the B rates at 2.4, do it. 6, 9, 12, you know, maybe, maybe even 18. Uh, Chuck made the case for uh, even new case uh, this morning, okay? Uh, there's, all they do is consume uh, <coughs> airtime, uh, not just for the clients, uh, but for the beacons and probes and everything else. So uh, cut the rates. 20 megahertz is usually better in most cases. I'm OK sometimes with 40 megahertz if you have the DFS channels on. And uh, a lot of people get mad at me with this, but I'm kind of old school. Um, static channel and power settings, if you can, especially in, in uh, very intense environments. Um, 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 although the dynamic protocols are, are getting better, I think uh, somebody up there has his hand up. Yes, sir. Well, I highly disagree with that, and respectfully. Okay, and isn't your presentation going to be on this bottom bullet here? Okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry. All right, and one more thing about design, and let's get back to the troubleshooting. But this is part of troubleshooting. If you have design, you, you don't have to do a lot of Wi-Fi troubleshooting. And uh, so I was talking to a friend of mine in Apple at lunch uh, uh, yesterday. A little name dropping. So. High power is bad. It gives you capacity problems. It increases CCI. Hidden, increases hidden node problems. Mismatched power settings. Excuse me. My ear's falling off. Um, uh, roaming problems, sticky problems. And um, so low power is good, OK? Um, it's a natural human tendency to turn it up. It's kind of like the analogy I use is the Spinal Tap movie, where they turn up the amplifier to 11 because 11 is louder. Um, well, it's, everybody wants to turn their APs up. And in most cases, high power is bad. Yes, sir? What is the power that's currently being recommended? 
It just depends on the situation and the design. If it's very high density, it's going to be a lot lower. Typically, I start uh, personally in just a standard design. I typically start at about uh, 20, 25 milliwatts and go on down from there. And that's that's and that's why that that's one reason that's a good starting point. To me, anything over 20, 25 milliwatts in most cases is usually too high, because then you start running into all these problems. Now, there's nothing's written in stone, um, but I mean, when you start getting into those uh, like 1 AP per uh, classroom designs that Keith likes so much, um, you have to you have to get down to you know, I mean, you're getting down to the one milliwatt level. Okay, transmit power. All right, so, and then finally, the last tenet, um, your, your Wi-Fi sucks, and uh, that's what you're going to hear, because you're always, it's always going to get blamed whether it's causing the problem or not. So let's go back to the OSI model, and let's talk about troubleshooting in a little bit more detail. So once again, start at layer one. And what can be, 70% of problems occur at layer one, whether they're Ethernet or whether they're wireless problems, okay? Um, RF interference can obviously be a problem. So that's why spectrum analysis is important. Try to eliminate the sources of interference. Um, once again, the client and uh, driver problems we mentioned. Misconfigured security supplicants, which we'll be hitting uh, towards the end of the presentation. And then PoE problems uh, with the, your access points, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then bugs. So let's take a quick look at that. Um, spectrum analysis, obviously, guys, uh, Try to do a spectrum analysis before you deploy, uh, but RF interference can always show up after the deployment as well. Um, everybody should own a spectrum analyzer, and the best thing to do is try to eliminate the source of interference as opposed to designing around it, and you know, bring a hammer with you and get rid of the microwave oven. Um, this is a problem you see all the time, and uh, quite a bit, and uh, it's really not a Wi-Fi problem, but, but it affects your Wi-Fi, and that people don't do careful PoE uh, budgeting, power budgeting. And what happens is, if you exceed your uh, budget, your APs start randomly rebooting. And I've been seeing this problem for years, and it's getting worse because there's lots of other devices that are also powered uh, over the Ethernet cable. And um, as we start moving to the 4x4x4 MIMO access points, they're going to need more than 15.4 watts, which means that PoE plus and AT is going to become more prevalent. And it's also going to be a bigger drain on your power budget. So you solve that issue simply by proper budgeting. Don't exceed your power budget. You won't have APs randomly rebooting. Um, of course, bugs, um, every vendor has them. Um, very often they occur after firmware updates. The best thing you can do with that, it, these are sometimes very uh, hard to troubleshoot, but um, this is usually when you're getting your vendor's uh, support um, uh, team in, um, to help you out, and you're going to have to supply them with packet captures and uh, tech data logs. Now, when you get to layer two, after you, if you can determine it's not a layer one problem, so it's not a client issue, it's not a driver issue, it's not RF interference, or it's not bad design, which very often causes uh, layer one problems, you can start moving up to layer two. And once you get to layer two, the problems that can occur include roaming problems, layer two retries, and authentication and association problems. So first, let's talk um, about um, uh, roaming here in the next slide. And uh, I guess in the presentation that's going on next door, they're doing uh, wild packets. And uh, I'll just tell you, one of the best things that I did for my career in Wi-Fi is 15 years ago, I bought like the first version of Air Magnet, Air Magnet version one, and I taught myself uh, 802.11, I guess, B frame, uh, wireless frame analysis back then. And it was one of the best things that I ever did. And I've since gone on to use a lot of other packet capture uh, tools, but um, uh, as Chuck was also saying, learn the frame exchanges, look, dig into the packets, dig into the frames, uh, you'll learn a lot. And it will help you troubleshoot, shoot, especially when you start getting to layer two. Uh, when you, roaming problems, uh, typically the b biggest cause of roaming problems, uh, number one, are uh, client problems, once again, uh, drivers. So you start running into driver problems. Um, that, uh, clients usually make the roam, are, for the most part, make the roaming decision. If they have bad drivers, they don't roam well. Um, sticky problem, uh, that's usually due to bad design. Okay, you got the APs at full power. 
you got too many APs. And so the clients are sticking to an AP even though they're standing underneath a new AP. And then of course layer three roaming goes to design. Make sure you, you have proper layer three uh, roaming implementation. And then when you, if you want a good fast secure roaming, it really just depends on your client side support, what they support. Um, not all clients support OKC, and as a matter of fact, quite a few did not. The iOS devices never supported OKC, okay? Um, uh, most infrastructure vendors support it, but not all clients did. Um, and same thing now with 802.11R and 802.11K. Most access points support it, but there's the support on the wireless client side is finally starting to grow. iOS devices for ex and a lot of Android devices now support R and K mechanisms. Um, as we get more client-side support of these, roaming will get better, but just understand um, you may run into issues if the client simply doesn't support these fast, secure roaming mechanisms, whether they're the legacy ones or the new ones. And of course, one of my favorite topics is layer two uh, uh, retransmissions, because layer two retransmissions affect your um, throughput and the performance of your wireless LAN. So most of you know this, all unicast traffic is acknowledged. A uh, unicast frame is sent by a transmitter. A CRC, the receiver um, uh, runs a CRC and if it passes, it sends an ACK frame. If that fails, if you send a unicast frame and the CRC fails, then no ACK frame is sent and then you have the retry. And layer two retries are one of the worst things that can happen to your wireless LAN in terms of performance. Now, there's always a certain amount of layer two retries. Everybody knows that. Um, it's when you start exceeding 10% and getting into the 20% levels that you have problems because it's all about cause and effect. Things that can cause layer two retries is a layer one problem, RF interference. Another thing that can cause layer two retries is bad design. Because if you have a low SNR, if your signal strength gets too low to the noise floor, you start getting a lot of retries, and that's usually due to bad design. Adjacent cell interference can cause co-channel interference, can cause uh, contention uh, overhead, but it can also cause uh, retries. Once again, that's a bad design. And then also hidden nodes caused by bad design or that just pop up will often cause retries. So it's all cause and effect. If you get the retries, everybody should know this, your throughput tanks. And then if you have lots of uh, retries, um, your latency goes up. And this is very, very important, especially for time-sensitive applications like voice. Um, and that's why you need a really, really high SNR to make sure you don't have a lot of retries for voice. So once again, a lot of this goes back to design, but these are the things that you can look at. If you're getting a high percentage of retries, you can try to identify what the root cause is of those retries, okay? Um, so, uh-oh. We have another call. Hello, this is Wi-Fi support. Can I help you? Hi, this is Bob in classroom 405. <laughs> He's got a whole bunch of new tablets for use in my classroom, and, and none of them are working because your Wi-Fi sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sir. Um, there's no need to insult the Wi-Fi, but I'm sure we can help you out. Um, so um, when you try to connect, do you put in a username and password, or do you just put in a password? Uh, it, it keeps prompting me for a passphrase. OK, um, well, let's take a, a look at that real quick. I'm going to log into the system. And we'll take a quick look to see what we can find. We, we need to get this fixed pretty quick. I mean, my class starts here in five minutes, and these, these new tablets need to work. Okay, sir. Okay. I'm trying to isolate on your MAC address to try to find the problem for you. And I think I might have found it right here. It says the, the pro, your pre-shared key, you might have a mismatch. And if I look right here, I see something called the four-way handshake that keeps failing. Um, can I get you to type in your passphrase again? Uh, that was the uh, Arrowhive123 password, Yes, right? yes. Turn off your caps locks. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, it, it looks like it's working now. Okay. Thank you for calling Wi-Fi support. Okay. So this is a very easy one to troubleshoot, and that is uh, PSK authentication. Um, it's just a static passphrase, but the problem is if they're typing it in wrong, 
uh, it's what is the seed that generates the pairwise master key. And if that pairwise master key is not generated, uh, is not properly created because of a passphrase mismatch, the four handshake fails. Okay, and you can see that in a lot of vendors troubleshooting tools like the one I just showed you or in any good uh, protocol analyzer. So that's a fairly simple one to troubleshoot is uh, PSK authentication. They're simply typing in the wrong passphrase and it happens more commonly than you would think. Now 802.1x is a lot more complex. 802.1x uses port-based access control, an authorization framework that requires a supplicant, which is the client trying to get on the network, the authentication server, which validates the client credentials, the access point, which is the authenticator in between the two, and it integrates with LDAP. Uh, you're using a layer two authentication protocol called EAP, and 802.1x, uh, uh, when it's properly deployed, uh, uses a server-side cert and a root cert that has to be installed on the supplicant. So there are a lot of points of failure, and that's what we're getting ready to talk about right here. Um, the whole point of 802.1x is it gives you tunneled uh, authentication to protect your authentication credentials. Oh, not again. <laughs> Hello, this is Wi-Fi support. Can I help you? Hi, this is Randy. I'm the <laughs> science teacher and the IT tech coordinator out at uh, Coleman High School. And uh, none of the new access points that you gave us last week are working right now. Oh, you, you didn't say your Wi-Fi sucks. <laughs> well, I was getting there. <laughs> Let me see if I can fix it. <laughs> okay, so we'll uh, take a look at your system real quick. And give me one second, and we'll take a look and see on your MAC address what we can see. And right here it says that we cannot reach the radius server. Um, oh, figures it's something up there in the district headquarters with your Active Directory, huh? Well, let's take a quick look. Um, I'm going to choose your, uh, uh, the AP that you're connected to, and I'm going to run a quick test on it. APs myself, I'm sure they're configured correctly. Oh, I'm sure they are. <laughs> After all, I am an expert Wi-Fi technician here at the high school. Do you have your CWNA, sir? Uh, what's CWNA? Oh. <laughs> okay, according to this, um, there's no configuration for your server. Oh, let's tr try one more test real quick. And I'm pretty sure it's your Active Directory. You guys oh, it, I'm problem. getting a message that the Radius server rejected the access request message and that you should check this shared secret. So, oh, so it's a Radius server problem yes. on your end, huh? Y yes. So we'll, t we'll get that fixed for you, sir. Okay, so a lot of things can go wrong. And when you're troubleshooting, especially with 802.1x, look at zones. And you can start with the back end zone. If you see where the radius server and a packet capture is not replying at all, it's a back-end problem. Now, those back-end problems can be numerous. Number one, it could have a shared secret mismatch. This is a problem. Uh, number two, you have incorrect IP settings. You could have a port mismatch or LDAP communications error. So just to summarize that real quick, the things that can go wrong on the back-end, number one, shared secret. If they don't match, you're not getting on, okay? Um, number two, if the IP settings between the radius server and the AP are wrong, you're not getting on. Um, the, if you have mismatched port settings, typically your radius authentication port's 1812, but it could be 1645. If they don't match, you're not getting on. And a lot of times you might run into an LDAP communications error um, between the radius server and the LDAP server. So isolate the problem. If the radius server's not responding, it's a back-end problem. Yes, sir. Excuse me? Uh, you would have to look, in most cases, if you're going to troubleshoot this, you're going to have to get a wired packet capture. Um, what I actually just showed you is a tool that we have at our company and our cloud-based solution that can actually test the back-end communications between an AP and, um, and a radio server. Um, but to actually look at the, this communication right here, you would have to plug it in on the wire. 
you would, it would look like this right here. Something like this. You would basically see the supplicant start to descend something, and you would just never see the radius server reply. You would, never see, you would never see a response from the radius server. So basically, you're seeing right there, you're sending a message, and then it just stops. So if the communications stop, you have a back-end problem. And you can point to that problem right away. Now, if it's not a back-end problem, it's almost always the supplicant. And if the SSL tunnel fails, so this could be a wireless packet capture right here, and you saw that the SSL tunnel was not established, well, that's going to be a certificate problem, OK? Um, and uh, there can be a lot of problems with certificates. It could be an expired certificate. It could be the root certificate is in, uh, installed in the wrong store of the uh, lap of the PC, excuse me. Um, it could be incorrect clock settings. I mean, I've run into that a ton of times where people roll back the clocks on their wireless devices, and it predates the creation of the certificate. And they can't get onto the 802.1x secure network. Um, it's something as simple as that could be causing the problem. And then if you have mismatched EAP types as well, uh, if the client-side EAP protocol doesn't match the radio server, it's not going to work. So these are all issues that point to the client. Other issues that point to the client is that the radius server rejects the requests of the client. And so these kind of problems include uh, an expired password or expired user account, wrong password if they're actually typing it in, maybe the user doesn't exist in LDAP, or uh, one that I've actually seen quite a bit is where they have the wrong kind of authentication configured on the uh, supplicant. Maybe they've configured it for machine authentication, and they're not using machine authentication. And um, so that can all be very easily seen in proper uh, packet captures. And a lot of the tools that the vendors like Arrowhive and Aruba and uh, our competitors are producing now can actually uh, do um, a proactive analysis of these things by looking at these captures and kind of point you in the right direction. Um, there's a blog on this that I wrote a long time ago that covers this particular topic, and when you guys get the slides, uh, it'll have that URL. Okay, so we're getting towards kind of the end of uh, my presentation here, and we're moving on from Wi-Fi problems. And as I mentioned, Wi-Fi gets blamed quite a bit for problems that it is not causing. So if it's not a layer one or a layer two problem, it's not a Wi-Fi problem. It's very often a networking problem. Look at layer three. Um, if it's layer four, very often it's a firewall problem. And then as you move up the stack, it's an application problem. So once again, if you can eliminate layer one and layer two, then you can start focusing on where the real problem is. Now, from the end user perspective, they don't know. They don't care. Um, they just know that they can't get to the internet um, over their Wi-Fi, and they can't uh, get to Facebook. Okay, um, so, okay, here we go again. Yeah, hello, this is uh, David's Wi-Fi support. Can I help you, sir, again? Yeah, this is Randy at Coleman High School again. You said you fixed my problem. I just got off the phone with you, but it's still not working because your Wi-Fi sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well, do you have a, can you see if you have a wireless connection, sir? Yep, I've got, I've got a connection, but it's got a, an exclamation point on it. Okay, and can you tell me if, uh, can you read me your IP address, please? Sure, it says uh, 169.254.101.32. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, um, I'm going to take a look at this, and I'll call you back. Okay. Um, if it's... Uh, uh, not getting an IP address, um, uh, for example, it, it's going to be a higher layer problem, obviously. Um, we have a tool, and a lot of other vendors do as well. We can do a simple DHCP probe from the access points, and you can go up the entire uh, network from your AP, through your switches, through your IP helper address and your router, all the way to the server, get lease offers, and then knack it. And by doing this, you can go from top to bottom to kind of troubleshoot and look at where the problems might be on your network. Um, and there's many points of failure. So um, I'll just show you real quickly um, what one of these looks like. So I can take an AP. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, we'll choose an AP real quick, 
And I'm going to go to a, a troubleshooting utility. And just type in a quick command. Okay, so I'm basically, what I'm doing right here is I'm sending a DHCP request. I'm telling an AP to send DHCP requests across a range of 10 VLANs. And then, once again, I can do a top to bottom analysis, and we'll see if we can take a look at the results, and then we'll talk about the individual points of failure. Going to I guess I'm messing up my demo here. Oh, it'd help if I type in the command correct. One more try, and then I'll move on. Okay, well, I just blew it completely blew that demo, so I apologize for that. But bottom line, let's talk about the points of failure. Um, if you can see that um, you cannot communicate with, across a certain range of VLANs and uh, networks, uh, it can be a, a variety of problems. Uh, it could be the IP helper address. It's typically not going to be the problem. A uh, more common problem is going to be the DHCP server. You could be out of leases, okay? The DHCP server could be down, could be misconfigured. But uh, where we see the problem uh, nine out of 10 times uh, very, very often is they've changed something. The customer has gone onto the switch and they've disabled a VLAN, or they uh, don't have that uh, VLAN being trunked properly to the access point. So once again, it's all about isolating the area, isolating the zones, and if you can go up the stack, and use a little bit of common sense, you can, you can and implement proper troubleshooting procedures, you'll troubleshoot the problem a lot faster. Um, so I wanted to open it up to, uh, uh, one more. Yes, hi, this is David's Wi-Fi support. Can I help you? Hi, David. This is Andrew. I, I'm in my hotel room right now, and I can't get connected to the Wi-Fi. It's, it's not working because your Wi-Fi sucks. Okay. <laughs> um, so are you on the guest Wi-Fi, sir? Yeah, I connected, and I, I put in my name and room number, but it, it's not working. Oh, and... Uh, and are you opening a browser? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the login page just automatically popped up when I connected. Oh, it's a captive web portal. Sorry, dude, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm not a big fan of captive web portals either, but I will say this very often. The first thing you should look at with a captive web portal problem is a DNS. Um, if uh, type in an IP address, and if it all of a sudden starts uh, working, you've isolated the problem to being a DNS, and after that, you're on your own, because uh, we all know that they, uh, uh, they're kind of an abomination to God. Um, any uh, questions before we wrap it up here? Pretty about the same you do. <laughs> okay. All right, well, um, thank you very much uh, for your time, everybody. Uh, once again, uh, use common sense. Troubleshooting is impor important, and um, Thanks again for having me. Okay.